Thelma, I'm so excited to have her here. Um, I'm really proud to have gotten her to speak to the club. <laughs> Thelma grew up in Emporia, Virginia, attended both Virginia State University and Norfolk State University. She received her bachelor's in science in health and physical education. After teaching in Fairfax County School District in Virginia, Thelma moved to California, where she continued as a classroom teacher. She then proceeded to earn her master's degree in curriculum and instruction, and then her counseling credential. After serving as a middle school counselor and later as a high school counselor, Thelma continued her education and obtained her administrative credential. She then served as a high school principal for the last 14 years of her 43 year career as an educator. Thelma has earned several honors and awards from her local school districts. One of her greatest accomplishments was when her school, City Honors High School in Inglewood, California, was comprised mostly of Black and Latino students, was given a silver award by the U.S. News and World Report as one of America's best schools. Thelma brings us a wealth of knowledge about education, but also personal revelations about her life experiences as an African-American woman. Thelma, thank you. Thank you, Lana. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, friends, and guests. I would like to thank you for inviting me here to speak to you today. Feel free to jot down any questions that you may have for me after this, because I will be going back and forth, and I speak to you today with many conflicted feelings and deep emotions. So um, as I said, I'll be going back and forth and I may not be consistent. So you, there may be questions at different parts of my speech. So just jot them down if you have any. My goal today is to appeal to the decency, truthfulness, calmness, and kindness in each of us which will have a profound effect on our inner soul and heart. And I might cry, so. As Lana said, I grew up in a small town, Emporia, Virginia. Emporia consisted of blacks and white Jewish people. It was very small. There was a small amount of non-Jewish white people that lived in the town. And our town, I have to say, for whatever the reason, was protected from the racism and the ugliness that persisted outside of the town. I grew up in a family of love, dignity, and respect. My uncle and I, <clears throat> whom I brought to live with us when he was 86 in California, and whom was a toxicologist, we were the darkest in our immediate family. Some of my family members passed for white when necessary, because that was the rule back then. If you had 10% black blood in you, you were black, even though you I mean, my uncle's wife, uh, looking at the screen today, kind of looked like Carol. <laughs> and she had blue eyes and black hair. Um, she passed for white many times. And I'll never forget um, when I'd go downtown sometimes, I couldn't speak to her because she didn't live in Emporia, but when she came to visit and she'd go to the beauty salon to get her hair done. And I would walk past that beauty salon going to the five and 10 cent store. I couldn't speak to her because at that particular time she was passing for white. Um, <sighs> things were also separate but not less than. Uh, I was taught at a very early age 
to code switch. Code switching is speaking differently to my friends when I'm out playing or just with my friends in general. Then speaking differently in the classroom to your teacher or to other adults. And then definitely speaking differently in the presence of white people. When I say things were separate but not less than, I struggled to find the word <laughs> less than because at first I had things were separate but equal. But then I thought about it, I said, no, they weren't equal, but they were not less than. We had our black lawyers, our black doctors, our wonderful black teachers. My elementary school was fantastic. We had a great auditorium, kind of like the grand cinema back in the day, but three times the size. My high school had a beautiful gymnasium. We, I had a beautiful high school. Um, the curriculum was great. For that time, we, in, foreign, in the foreign languages, I could have taken Spanish, Latin, or French. And I chose Latin and French. Um, we had beautiful science labs, uh, chemistry, physics, trig. I remember all of that. So it wasn't like we did not have what we did not need. It was just that we were on one side of the town and the white people were on the other side. And that's why I say it was separate, but not less than. Um, as Lana said, I went to an HBU and I just want to share one experience because that's gonna lead into my next topic. My major at the time was health and physical education. And back then you could not take one without the other as you can today. So I had to take the kinesiology, uh, the physiology classes, the anatomy, the biology, all of that. And then when it came to physical education, this particular semester, I decided to take tennis. So in taking tennis and taking any physical education class, you wore a certain outfit. So for this tennis class, we had these cute little tennis skirts and tops and you know, the tennis shoes. And so we were just cute. And it was really today, it would have been just appropriate and cute. And the skirts came down to maybe right above the knee, maybe at the thigh level. They were just really cute. So two of my other friends, we decided, we were on our way to English 101, and we decided, oh, let's not go back to the dorm to change today. Let's just go to class so we'll get there early. And we did. We went to our English class. And of course, all of our professors were very professional. They always dressed earrings, women, lipstick, makeup, hair, everything in place, heels. So we're sitting there and Miss Woosley comes in, a little short, dark lady, glasses, big shiny earrings, jewelry, scarf, um, suit. And she puts her books down and we're all ready to start class. And she says, Oh, Miss Dickerson and Miss Smith and Miss Young, would you three ladies please get up and step outside? I was Miss Dickerson. My name was Thelma Dickerson. So I was totally embarrassed that I had to even be called by the teacher like that. So we did. And she said, You three girls go back to your dorm and put on correct clothing. You will not sit in my class with your PE uniform on. So we did. And I asked one of my friends, what did they do while we were changing our clothes? And she said that Miss Woos, we had them to read a story. Well, when we got back, class started. And after class, Miss Woosley called us up after everyone had left. 
And she said, girls, don't you ever come to my class again dressed improperly. So I'm saying that to say, not only did we have to be academically prepared, we had to be prepared socially and emotionally as well. And we were taught respect and proper etiquette. So my point is today, for people to label us as with inappropriate names, such as thugs and criminals and worst, it's, it's hurtful and it's heartbreaking when you know what you've been taught and, and how you try to proceed in this society. Yes, people make mistakes, we all do in all races, but to just label a race as, as, as being the worst, it's just heartbreaking. That's, that's the only word I can find for it. And then people ask, why does something like Black Lives Matter evolve? I didn't always support Black Lives Matter in the very, very beginning, because I'm going to make really sure we're on the right side and we're doing the right thing and we're right before we move forward. But I had to step back and I realized Black lives will always be undervalued as long as humanity, kindness, respect, and justice continue to decline. That's just a fact. I want to say that again because Black lives will always be undervalued as long as humanity, kindness, respect, and justice continues to decline. Now my personal experiences. Like I told you, I grew up, I guess, in a la-la land, but it was a happy time. But when I go out, I dress up, I make sure I have on my earrings, I make sure I have on my lipstick. I make sure my hair is combed and I look nice because I want to be sure I get the positive response that I really, really want. You don't have to do that. You can just go out and be free and be yourself because you're white. I can't do that. I don't have that privilege. Um, even though I had a good life coming up, and there were subtle, I grew up with very subtle racism. But when I became 64, I had the worst experience of my life. And I just thank God that he protected me all these years. I've just had a band of angels around me. And I, I just, didn't have to experience what other people have experienced. Uh, when I was 64, I was going shopping at Home Goods, and some of you have heard this um, experience before. And I thought, oh, let me stop by the bank really quickly, because that's my favorite store, and I know what happens. And ladies, you know what happens when we go to Home Goods. So I wasn't paying attention. I pulled in and there was a truck in front of me and uh, I figured, oh, let me call my friend Dee and just let her know what I'm doing. And we were talking. And after we finished, I realized I had been sitting there, wow, maybe 10 minutes. And I thought, my God, what is going on with this person in front of me? And it was a truck. And then I looked and the truck wasn't even pulled up to the uh, teller part where you get your money another car could have gotten in front of him. So I looked and the person kept bending over and it was a man. And so finally, I just got out of my car. I said, you know, I'm just gonna run up here. I just want cash and I'm just gonna get my cash. This truck is not moving. 
But before I did that, I looked around for a security guard because I wanted, you know, if someone was out there, I was going to have them ask the person to, you know, if they were going to pull up or what were they going to do? Nobody. So I got out of my car, walked around the truck, got my money. And as I was waiting for the machine to give, give me my money, he mashed on his gas real loud. Zoom, zoom. Then he put his head out of the window and said, you nigger, you nigger, you nigger. And I just froze. I just asked God, I said, just don't let him hurt me. Just give me my money and let me go. And I looked around, there was nobody. It was just a moment. The bank security wasn't out there. And I was trying to see if there was a camera and my money was taken, the machine was just taking so long. And I just didn't want that man to get out of his truck. So my money came and I got my money. And for a moment, I guess it was God, I just got the strength. I, I had to walk back past his truck and he had his window down. And I don't know what happened, but I said, you should have had your paperwork filled out. And I kept walking and I got in my car and then I just backed up and pulled around that truck and left. And then I saw Thelma, you didn't even get his license plate. You didn't do anything. And I realized I was just frozen. I was scared. And so I went on to Home Goods and I got out and went in. And in this particular Home Goods, not like this one in Gig Harbor, when you first walk in, there's a bench, this long bench that you can sit, and then they have the carts. And it's like a seating area. And I sat down and I just broke down and cried. And I think that was my after reaction of fear. So one of the ladies came out and said, are you okay? And I said, no. And I told her what happened. So she said, well, <clears throat> why don't you come on into the store and shop and that'll make you feel better. And I don't know what happened when I got into Home Goods, but I wanted to go down each, I wanted to go down an aisle where there were no people. I just wanted to be alone. And every aisle I tried to go down, there was one person. So finally, I just said, okay, well, I'm just gonna go down the aisle and I'll just act like I'm looking at something on this side. And Three aisles I went down, and those three aisles, each aisle, two of the three were two what were white women. They spoke, they smiled, they said, I hope you're okay. I don't know if the lady made an announcement, I didn't hear it. I went down another aisle, the lady did the same thing. And that third aisle, there was a man and he smiled and spoke. And, and I, I felt it just made me, it gave me hope. It made me feel better. And I bought a little trinket or something and I left. But that was the worst experience that I had ever had with racism. Um, not like the black men who have been handcuffed and taken to jail and beat up and haven't had that. Um, my second experience, okay, was Purdy Restaurant in Gig Harbor. I went to this restaurant in Purdy for dinner, Dan and I with another couple. And the lady took my order first and I ordered a pizza. That's all I wanted was a pizza. Everybody put their order in and then everybody got their food except me. 
and everybody just about finished eating and I kept looking and looking <clears throat> and waiting and waiting and Dan kept saying, don't you want some of mine? I can call it. And I said, nope, I want my pizza. And so finally, at the end, they brought the pizza and it was burned. So, you know, was that racism? I don't know, but it did happen. Uh, there have been many, many subtle racism, racist experiences that I've had. But like I said, the one that I had at the age of 64 at the bank was the worst. Um, however, subtle racism can be very harmful because you don't see it coming until it hits you in the face. So uh, we just have to try to do better and forgive and keep hope alive. We had another speaker, Mike Ruzel, on our, uh, in our diversity group. And when he spoke, he mentioned that he had a song uh, that he related to for his uh, societal turmoils. Well, his song was from Sam Cooke, A Change Is Gonna Come. I really related to that because I had two songs. One of my songs was when George Floyd was killed and I cried for four days, uh, Many Rivers to Cross by Jimmy Cliff. Some of you may know it by Annie Lennox, but my favorite is Aletha Adams. After the hurt, anger, and healing, my second song was Wake Up Everybody by Teddy Pendergrass. And the importance of this song is that this song was written in 1975. And I just want to read a couple of the main points. He says, wake up all you teachers, teach the children a new way. Preachers, preach the truth. Politicians, stop lying. Businessmen, stop cheating. Regardless of race, creed, or color, we need each other. This song was written in 1975, 45 years ago. And here we are, 2020. In closing, we're all taught right from wrong at some point in our lives. I just can't give up on hope, decency, and respect. I hope that people will hold on to their decency and respect for themselves and their fellow members of our society. I always hold on to this poem. You may not remember what people say, you may not remember what people do, but you will always remember how people make you feel, always. White people will be affected by the erosion of our humanity, as well as minorities. So let's remember, fellow Rotarians, no matter our race, creed, or color, we need each other's decency, kindness, respect, in order to get to the justice and equity. I wanna commend all of you that are here today for listening and for going through this process with me because this is what it takes to move forward. And this is very hurtful, it's hard, and it is hard on you. It is hard for you to think about your ancestors and what Pastor Dan showed you. That has to be hard if you have an inkling of feelings in your soul. It's hard to face the past. It's hard for us. So we need each other. And let's keep hope alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. much.
Of course, I'm crying. Uh, I'm crying for Did you and with you. Pardon me? Did anyone have any questions? <laughs> I do. So, Thelma, the, you know, I doubt that anybody on this call today would be the guy in the truck. So are there other things that you would just say to look out for and, and recommend? Yes, the subtle racism. I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but maybe I should. I was on a book club here, and um, I got into the book club because of a friend of mine, and then she moved to another state. And there I was in this book club, and there were some very nice people in that book club. But I've already shared this with Pastor Dan. I went one day. <coughs> these two ladies, I mean, people were, you know, they were just eating, having a nice time. And I walk in with my dish, and these two ladies were standing, pointing at me, laughing, pointing. And I kind of looked around to see maybe they were, it was to someone else, and people weren't paying attention. They were eating and talking and doing other things, and it was just me. And so um, they looked me up and down. It was almost like a, a childish, something you do in elementary school or high school, and mean girls. And so, um, you know, I never, finally, I just, I went over to a couple of ladies that I felt like were gonna embrace me and say hi and welcome, and I did. And, but then another, the next time I went back, these same people, uh, they would discuss the book. At, at one point, there was uh, something related to African Americans. And when they'd speak, they never looked at me. They never spoke to me. They never, but, but they were very good at making me feel uncomfortable. So I just, I, I just stopped going. And I wrote a very nice card and I just said, I, at this time I can no longer continue with book club. I have other things I have to do. And there have been members that have asked me to come back, but I, the only way I'd go back is if I could just talk to the whole group and let them know why I left in the beginning. So uh, look out for the subtle racism when, because you don't see it. You could be at a party and I could be there and there could be someone else making a gesture poking their tongue out at me, rolling their eyes at me. You wouldn't see that if you're talking to someone else. So that's the type of thing that you do. You, but it, it's hard, you know, it, you just have to be aware of it. So tell me in that instance, would you say that what would have been helpful is if somebody noticed that you were off? you know, that something had upset you, that just embracing you at that point, you know? It would have been helpful if someone had seen those two women do it. See, nobody was, they weren't paying attention. You had, they were in one part of the room facing the door as I walked in. The refreshments were over in this corner, so people were around eating, and there were another, there was another group over here. So when I walk in, I'm facing these people, these two women. Nobody's really watching the dynamics. And so you'd have to see it. But Selma, would it help if you would confront those people? Yes, but um, it's hard to do. Uh, the, the problem with one of the ladies is that I heard a man at coffee talk negative about her. So I thought, oh my gosh, if he feels like that and he's white, I'm just not going back to book club. And, but, you know, I could approach her and say something to her if I saw her again. Thelma, does Dan as a white person notice these things? Sometimes. You want to answer for no. yourself? Sometimes. I imagine he would. 
yeah. sensitive to it. Yeah. yeah. Like at the restaurant, he was very agitated and kept telling me, you know, I'll, I'll give you some of my food. Let's just get another plate. But I didn't want what he wanted. I wanted my pizza. So I just kept thinking at first, I thought they were really going to bring it. And then, you know, that's what I mean by that subtle racism. You don't really, it's harmful because you don't see it until it hits you in the face. And people would deny it, I think. If you, well, of course they would. Yeah. yeah. And that's a crappy restaurant, Thelma. They're so busy. I never know. Because it's a really crappy restaurant. Which, which one? Is it a float? And the Massimo Rotation device? Massimo's. Oh, Massimo. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All righty, all right. Okay, Selma, thank you so much for taking your time and giving us your great presentation. Really, really great. Thank you, Selma. Thank you, Selma. Thank you, Selma. Thank you. Hug, hug, hug. Selma, we want you to come back. We want you to be permanent on this, on our, on our member list, not just absent once in a while. When, when COVID is over. Well, we are all here in COVID. We all are open for that one. COVID. Yeah, okay. All right, guys. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being courageous, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank, so thank you. Thank you. I hope thank you, you always Thelma. feel welcome here, Thelma. Oh, I, I do. Thank okay, you. Okay, good.